first case on this morning's docket. That is case number 102630, Prairie Land Electric Cooperative, Inc. v. Kansas Electric Power Cooperative, Inc. Again, I'm John McClymont. I appear on behalf of Prairie Land Electric. Uh, I am one of the petitioners for review with Sunflower, represented by Mr. McVeigh. We have determined to divide our 20 minutes uh, in the following fashion. I will have 12 and a half minutes, and I would ask the court for two and a half minutes of that to be reserved for rebuttal. And Mr. McVeigh will have seven and a half minutes, and I do not believe he plans to ask for rebuttal. That's acceptable. Okay. Thank you. Uh, at, at the outset, what Prairie Land is asking the Supreme Court to do is to reinstate the order of the District Court of Phillips County as entered by the Honorable William Elliott. Uh, we believe uh, the District Court was correct in making its determinations that Prairie Land had an all requirements contract with Sunflower. Uh, the Court of Appeals did not address Prairie Land's rights and obligations under that agreement, which was 20 years prior in time to the KEPCO agreement. Uh, Prairie Land also asserts that the Court of Appeals was incorrect when it determined that there was not ambiguity in the agreement. And we assert that the there were several ambiguities in the agreement dealing with <coughs> Uh, the word area or areas or the phrase areas of member system and Prairie Land also asserts that the KEPCO agreement entered 20 years after the Sunflower agreement was not an all requirements agreement as found by the Court of Appeals. Mr. McClyant, yes. you've mentioned a couple times already the first in time idea yes. and I, and I'd like to explore or have you explore for me the um, the legal significance of that as opposed to the factual significance it's, it's obvious that one contract came first the legal significance excuse me significance your honor is that sunflowers agreement con contained boilerplate requirements of the REA that sunflower that the sunflower provide in prairie land take all of its requirements from Sunflower. And that agreement, having been in place for 20 years and having been observed, was, um, we believe, prior and right, prior in time and prior and right. Now, at the time I think of the, the question is, is if we understand the prior in time, it's the prior in right. What, what legal um, basis do you have for saying that's uh, prior in right, I think is the question. Well, I believe that it's it's clear in the in the contract that it was an all encompassing agreement that could not be modified without the consent of both parties and we assert there was never any waiver or consent to that agreement being changed in the KEPCO when the KEPCO agreement was entered into 20 years later. Well, doesn't KEPCO's agreement that's entered into 20 years later specifically, essentially, incorporate that original agreement with Sunflower since it refers to the existing uh, provisions or, or what Sunflower is providing at that time for the, Prairie Land? Excuse me. The, the KEPCO agreement at the end of the first paragraph acknowledges that Sunflower has rights and duties uh, and that Prairie Land must observe its rights and duties and obligations to Sunflower for the rest of the Sunflower agreement. Right. So isn't Prairie Land obligated, even under that agreement, to first consider its, or at least consider its rights and obligations yeah. with Sunflower? Ab absolutely. Essentially incorporates that first in time agreement. Now, paragraph 6B of the same paragraph I assert is in conflict with that last line in paragraph 1 
because depending on how it is read, and it can be read a number of ways, it looks like it, it's an, an attempt to impinge on Prelan's obligations to Sunflower under the first agreement. Uh, that paragraph 6b talks about, um, you know, paragraph 1 clearly states that provided, however, Prairie Land shall continue to purchase electric power and energy under any existing contract or contracts with the supplier other than KEPCO, which, you know, would have been Sunflower. 6b says that if Prairie Land intends to continue to retain its membership with Sunflower and to procure from, from Sunflower its power requirements for the areas of its system presently served with power procured from Sunflower. Prairie Land and KEPCO agree that all of Prairie Land's power requirements to serve those areas of Prairie Land system other than those served with power procured from Sunflower shall be furnished to Prairie Land by KEPCO. That's what is so ambiguous. There's never any definition of areas. There's a lot of definition, a lot of specificity as to delivery points. And it, it, it makes no sense that there would be so much specificity as to delivery points and that there can't be new delivery points without mutual agreement, but that there is areas without a definition. We assert that areas should be construed to mean areas of Prairie Land's system, and its system, as Judge Elliott found, are the, the wires, the facilities, the substation equipment, and among that array of, of items that constitute a system, the, the uh, area would be delivery points here. I, I hope that's responsive to your question. I think so. Let's go back to your, your Sunflower contract, <clears throat> the letter agreement in particular, that that initially permits, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Prairie Land to continue purchasing some of its electric power and energy requirements from the power supplier, blah, blah, blah. What, what, uh, that, that agreement essentially talked about portions of your distribution system. If we agree with you that we can even look back to that 1958 agreement that was first in time, how do you define portions? Yeah. Portions would mean part of Prairie Land system again, not a geographical area, but part of the, the components of Prairie Land system. Uh, so delivery, so for instance, since there was an existing delivery point, Phillipsburg delivery point at that time, that is the portion of the distribution system it's referring to? Correct. And, and I, I might point out that, that the previous agreement, the agreement that KEPCO stepped into was an old Centel agreement right. from the 1950s. And that, and that agreement was clearly not an all requirements agreement. That was a partial requirements agreement. And that's what... KEPCO stepped into in 1977. As I just think about a plain meaning definition of the words, what you've just described in terms of portions of the system makes sense to me. I mean, I can take apart the transmission lines or other components of the system. But when I try to do that same thing with the phrase areas of the system, it just doesn't click for me. I don't see areas as having that same definition as portions. And that is one of the issues with 6B. Uh, that agreement in 1977, its drafting preparation was controlled by KEPCO as found by the district court. KEPCO's lawyers were present. There was an advisory committee that met for 15 months. Uh, my client, Prairie Land, did not have a member on the advisory committee. And this troublesome language in 6B, which contains that phrase, did not appear in the agreement until just a couple of weeks, several days, before the agreement was signed. So it, it's troublesome. It's there, isn't it? But it's there. It's, it's there, absolutely. But, uh, and but and so why that, should we... That, I'm sorry, go ahead. So why should we default to... Uh, what I, I see is a strained uh, application of the word um, rather than one that's more natural, more common sense, more everyday understanding of the word. 
I assert that that it, you should because the burden was on Kepco to make the agreement clear. Prairie Land was one one of only two members of two prospective members of Kepco out of like twenty three at that time that Section six B was going to apply to. It should have been made clear by the people in control of drafting the agreement during that point in time, 1977 to the present, Prairie Land has erected 22, 21 additional delivery points, and those delivery points are all served by Sunflower. There has never been an assertion by KEPCO that it had the right to serve those new delivery points created after the 1977 agreement. The first time that assertion was made is in this matter which led to the declaratory judgment action. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have one more question on. You want us to look at that 1958 letter agreement that define that doesn't define portions, and I understand, I think, how you want to define portions if we can get to it, but the Court of Appeals said because the district court didn't have that as a basis for its ruling, didn't look at that first contract that and you did not uh, cross petition from the district court's failure to consider that ruling that you weren't basically they weren't going to consider yet that argument and and I found that kind of interesting because it looked to me like Kepco presumed that that was part of the district court's ruling because that's issues 1a and b of their court of appeals brief but nevertheless the court of appeals said yep we're not going to go there and I wonder how you would have us get there if, if the Court of Appeals is correct that you had to cross petition from the district court's failure to consider that. It, it's, it is puzzling, Your Honor, because I think Mr. Sear, Mr. McVeigh, and I all read that same thing in, contrary to what the Court of Appeals found. What, what I think is important to remember is that the district court did expressly note uh, that KEPCO was fully aware of Prairie Land's obligations and duties to Sunflower under that prior agreement. It made an, a, an express finding. Um, That's pretty far removed from making a finding that that the first-in-time contract controlled legally and interpreting. It didn't interpret that provision that we're discussing the at of, all. I'm sorry. The mm -hmm. Court of Appeals also stated that that as an appellate court, it was in a, the same position as the same position to construe uh, the written contracts as the district court was, and I, I think there. I think an argument is a, a clear argument is that that there is there's a, another ambiguity between the court of appeals. There, there's an ambiguity in that the. KEPCO agreement is, is ambiguous as to how it digests and accounts for the earlier Sunflower agreement. And I think those agreements are before you and th this court can address those matters. You're not relying, as you said in your petition for review then, on that kind of odd, all-incorporating paragraph in the district court's findings about about anything, any findings that are not inconsistent with the court's finding from your brief, I believe, it sort of pulled in, which seemed unusual. We're, we're also <coughs> relying on what we believe the erroneous finding of the Court of Appeals that the KEPCO agreement was an all-requirements agreement and that there are the, the aforementioned ambiguities in the, in the agreement. And some of which deal with the phrase area or areas and and areas of member system, uh, the ambiguity between paragraph 1 and paragraph 6B that I touched on. Uh, so I, I hope this is responsive to your question. Well, I don't, it isn't really because I'm asking you in your petition for review, the, the primary reason you suggested that we could consider this issue, uh, even though the district court didn't, didn't, interpret the 1958 agreements um, the only reason you really offered that I saw was that somehow the district court 
impliedly made that alternative ruling through that last paragraph that incorporated your arguments that weren't inconsistent with its ruling. And I know that sounds confusing, but that's the way I read your petition for review. Uh, yeah, I, and are you suggesting you're not really relying on that now or as a basis for us to consider it? I rely on that, but I also rely on the erroneous finding regarding the all requirements uh, that KEPCO was an all requirements contract. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, my name is Jim McVeigh from Watkins, Calcare, and Great Bend. I represent Sunflower, as I explained, and Appley in this case. Um, I believe that this court's review is plenary. I believe that this court's view of the Court of Appeals decision. Um, I think I'm going to just uh, change my argument a little bit to simply address some of the questions that you had on the uh, first ones and, uh, and make it very clear where, where we are coming as far as those particular points are. Regarding the waiver argument, which is the question about the 1958 letter, it uses the term uh, portions of the system. Uh, we believe that that means, as, as it states, a portion of the distribution system itself, which as Mr. McClyma has explained, is very a physical place on that system, and, and that physical place on the system at the time was the Phillipsburg pumping station, I mean, sorry, the Phillipsburg substation. However, the word portion, uh, connotes and means something different than just a physical location. It's a portionality or an amount. And so that's also what Sunflower is also uh, alleging, that when we would have given permission for them to continue to allow Centel to sell a portion, uh, portionality in the electronic utility business means an amount, an amount of electricity, not just a location, which it does, it, which the word does, but also very clearly means an amount. And there was testimony at trial about that, and that's what the trial court found, uh, that what it means is there is a proportionality to it as the amount as well as the location. And so therefore, the only amount that Sunflower would have raised or the location that Sunflower would have uh, waived would be the Phillipsburg substation only to the amount of the contract at the time. Well, what is at issue is the Jayhawk pumping station, which exceeded that amount and exceeded that location and required a new uh, substation, which Sunflower has never waived. And in fact, Sunflower has served all 22 new substations that had to be placed upon Prairie Land System since 1977. I think that's what getting to the argument that you're, you're asking about on the, uh, the letter. I'll jump directly. Yes, but how do you, how do you I, I, I might have mis, misstated, I think it was your petition for review and not Prairie Lands that made the it, argument about the, it, the district courts <laughs> um, all incorporating a paragraph because the Court of Appeals said you failed to cross petition that issue of interpreting the priority of the 1958 agreement. Absolutely. And right. you dealt with that in your petition for review by saying, well, we didn't need to cross petition because there was this incorporating language. Absolutely. And, and I, I think that that's where the where I disagree with the Court of Appeals fervently on is that when uh, the, the trial court finds that they are going to adopt the findings of the of Sunflower and Prairie Land, as long as they're not contrary, and then makes the conclusory finding that Sunflower has the contractual right and obligation to serve the new Jayhawk pumping station. I think those are f affirmative findings. If but it got there. It got to that conclusion that Sunflower has the right by first looking at KEPCO and not Sunflower's initial agreement, but looking at KEPCO's and saying KEPCO didn't, so Sunflower did by default. That's it didn't get there the way that you're suggesting, at least as a, initially, that you get there. That's, that's what the Court of Appeals says. However, again, I think they're wrong. If you look at paragraph 28 of Sunflower's findings and facts and conclusions of law, it makes it very clear that the court 
these are the orders of this trial court pay paragraph twenty eight of sunflowers for findings of fact and conclusions law reads as follows the sunflower contract was in force and sunflower was capable of providing electric energy to jayhawk pumping station delivery point in december of two thousand five that's a specific factual finding about the language of sunflowers contract because we had to have the ability to serve that point for our all requirements contract language to kick in the court made that finding and it was an affirmative finding of our contract the court goes on sunflower has continued to serve the delivery point since that time the sunflower contract was prior in time to the kepco contract again this is a, an important finding because kepco's contract says specifically that you will continue to purchase your electric energy from sunflower because it was prior in time and that's where that comes into it so and would you i'm sorry could i yes because i think this is an important point yeah. that addresses your first yes. question mm -hmm. the kepco contract states specifically that prairie land shall continue to purchase electric power and energy from sunflower during the remainder of the term of the sunflower contract sunflower has the contractual right to serve the new jayhawk pumping station and in, a, in the conclusory finding that again it is the trial court's finding because it was adopted the court finds therefore this court finds that sunflower contractor has the superior right to serve the jayhawk pumping station again this, that's on the record on appeal that was before the intermediate appellate court and it's a finding of the trial court that i believe that was disregarded when the court of appeals made its findings on page seven of the court of appeals decision that that i believe is inaccurate and frankly, I believe the Court of Appeals decision is inaccurate in a couple of other ways, if I may, unless there's so some other questions. I guess I do want to try to understand. And, uh, so you're saying that because the KEPCO contract refers back to the Sunflower contract and, and uh, recognizes that contract, that you wouldn't necessarily even reach the issue about whether uh, paragraph 6 is ambiguous absolutely you can't because you first go and you'd analyze what's under the sunflower agreement as as far as absolutely and i will right. acknowledge that the uh, trial court went 27 pages in finding why the kepco mm -hmm. contract mm -hmm. is not enforceable against mm -hmm. this this load and i think that was one of the confusing points about this is that they went and ticked through three really major points why that contract wasn't enforceable but the but but our position is is these affirmative findings of the trial court are affirmative findings of the sunflower contract that had the superior contractual right to serve this load i don't really care personally what 6b says because the truth is you can't sell the same house twice we already had an agreement to sell this load. They cannot sell it out from underneath of us, and that's acknowledged in the contract that KEPCO has, and it certainly is an all-requirements contract that we have. And that was not addressed by the, the intermediate appellate court. And I, I, I believe that they found a path, to answer your question, uh, Madam Justice, I believe they may have arguably found a tortured path to, to say KEPCO could could serve this load but they did not uh, look at sunflower's contract and, and i would ask the court to keep this in context this this is a declaratory judgment action asking the trial court to make a decision uh, to to review both contracts which it did and ask the trial court specifically to make a determination which contract has the superior rights which the which the trial court did to serve this load that is an affirmative finding of the trial court of our contract that the intermediate court does not address ideally and, you would have made a, a motion you would have motion for a rehearing or modification and said trial court you kind of missed the point here you ruled for us but you didn't rule on these grounds but I but i i mean i can understand perhaps why you didn't but i i think they did rule on the grounds with with the language that i cited um, and, and I believe that they made, a, and the trial court did make affirmative findings about our superior rights uh, by the specific language of the trial court adopting our findings. Counsel? Uh, I do agree that it's... Counsel, I'd like to ask a question on that, the, uh, and it has to do with the difference between a finding and a conclusion of law. And I think maybe that's a little bit what my colleague's trying to get to. You've talked about findings made by the district court, that the findings are there to support your argument, 
but I'm still struggling a little bit with how you get from those findings of prior in time to a legal conclusion of prior and right. And, and, and let me say that these were part of the conclusions of law of the trial court, because that's the portion of, if you look at our suggested findings of fact and conclusions of law, these are conclusions of law. Okay. And, and that's why I believe So he adopted, that, he did a blanket adoption of everything that did not conflict from both the findings and conclusions. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's our position. And I'm way out of time. If I have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I do want to make sure you got interrupted when you said you had a couple of other points about where the Court of Appeals erred. And without launching off into necessarily why, I'd like to know what those points were that you wanted to highlight. It's really on page seven of the Court of Appeals decisions that I believe are inaccurate. Uh, I, I I think that we did not have an obligation to cross the bill because there was no adverse rulings. You can't find any any page of those or paragraph or sentence or conclusion anywhere in that 27 pages that's adverse to Sunflower's positions. And I don't think that we could complain of any of those findings, especially when the court adopts the conclusions of law of our superior rights. Um, so I, I simply disagree that the Court of Appeals and its interpretation of the trial court's 27 pages is that Sunflower only got it by default. There's no statement anywhere in the trial court's findings that we got it only by default. Um, in, in addition, uh, they go on and say that uh, the trial court didn't say that Sunflower had precedence over the KEPCO contract. It was just because we were chosen. I think the conclusions of law adopted by the trial court when it says superior rights and has the contractual right, I think uh, is, is very contrary to the Court of Appeals determination of that point. Any further questions of counsel? There were two delivery points. I think Stockton was one, I can't remember what the other was, that KEPCO added um, some point on Prairie Land system, isn't that right? At some point during I really have hearing problems. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Weren't there two delivery points, Stockton and another one, that KEPCO was added at some point? In, uh, that yes, serving later. Prairie Land. That's correct. And uh, was I, there? Were, I didn't see anything in the record about any waiver by 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 Sunflower with respect to those. How did how did that happen? Um, the 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 two delivery points that were added at the time were at a time when Sunflower still because it really wasn't part of this litigation those points wasn't did not have it and there's testimony about this specifically at the time uh, back in 1977 didn't have the ability under the all requirements contract and now we do to serve that amount of load through new generation of, that we do have but do you didn't really have the ability did you really have the ability to serve this Jayhawk station uh, at least at the time it was proposed? Oh, absolutely. You did, I mean, I guess I'm trying to understand the distinction between having the ability and not having the ability. Well, if you, if, again, if you look at the, the findings of the trial court about the ability to serve that load, and there's testimony, and it's a factual finding by the court, mm -hmm. and, and that Sunflower, because the, the contract language of the all requirements contract that Sunflower has with Prairie Land says that it's an all requirements contract up to the, basically the ability to serve the load. Okay. Any further questions of counsel? Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, Timothy Sear on behalf of KEPCO. Let me uh, touch on some issues that have all been already been raised uh, this morning. The issue of the Sunflower contract being prior in time and argued to be uh, somehow legally superior is a claim that has no basis in law. And in the extensive briefing that there has been in this case, both, both at the trial court, the Court of Appeals, and on rehearing and supplemental briefs in this court, there is not a single case cited by Sunflower or Prairie Land for why an earlier contract in this context in some way has precedence or superiority. In fact, when the KEPCO contract 
was, I'm sorry, when the KEPCO agreements with its members at formation in 1977 were drafted. It was drafted in the context of some of the KEPCO 19 members, including Prairie Land, already had an all requirements contract with Sunflower and the contract was drafted so it would work in concert with the existing Sunflower contract that Prairie Land had. And so that's why there is the incorporation of the Sunflower, or the references to the Sunflower contract, and also why it's important that there was the 1958 Sunflower letter agreement allowing Prairie Land to serve portions of the Prairie Land system through a supplier other than Sunflower. So this comes as no surprise in 2005 or today that KEPCO is supplying power to portions of the Prairie Land system that were not served by Sunflower at a certain point in time, September 21, 1977. There is no doubt, and it's undisputed in this case, that the area of the Jayhawk pumping station, the load that is in dispute in this case, sits at nearly the geographic center of an area or a portion of the prairie land system which was not served by Sunflower on September 21, 1977. KEPCO has an all requirements contract with Prairie Land to serve that portion or that area of the Prairie Land system and to serve all its power needs, just as Sunflower has an all requirements contract with Prairie Land to serve all the areas or portions of the Prairie Land system that Sunflower was serving on September 21, 1977. That is a date carved in granite and the area is set and carved in granite as of the September 21, 1977 date. So you're just saying the KEPCO contract froze in place the Sunflower service area? Correct. What, how, I hate to use the word area in, the, in this context, but just whatever service was being provided by Sunflower, it was frozen in place. With all due respect, Your Honor, there is nothing wrong with the use of the word area or portion when you're talking about geographic areas or geographic locations or however you would describe it that you're going to provide power to. Electricity is provided through circuits. All of the witnesses in this case at trial, whether they were witnesses for KEPCO, for Prairie Land, or Sunflower, all testified that if you wanted to look and see who was serving any certain geographic location, area, or portion at any point in time, you would look at a circuit diagram because the circuit diagram creates an operational boundary, in the words of Sunflower's witnesses, that encircles the area served by the substation that serves that area. And there is no breaching of those boundaries. There is no discretion under an all requirements contract to move those boundaries. And the testimony was at trial that the only time outside power, if you will, had come into that area or that portion was for emergency purposes or maintenance purposes and those carve outs or exceptions are specifically found in both the KEPCO 
and the sunflower contracts that is the parties realize that they have these all requirements contracts and that they are to be able to provide all the power all the time into that circuit or that area or that portion but there can be emergency situations where there's power lines down and so forth or maintenance reasons why it's necessary to bring outside power in on a short-term basis and then return it to the original circuit when that situation has been remedied. So there are no surprises in this case, Your Honors. The only surprise that there was was that 30 years into this relationship in which no one had ever claimed that anyone had violated these all requirements contracts, all of a sudden the decision is made by Prairie Land that they're going to plop down a brand new delivery point, a brand new sub substation to serve a single load in the geographic center of an area never previously served by Sunflower and always served by Centel or its successor or s and &E, Kepco. In fact, the testimony at trial was that the initial conclusion was of Prairie Land, contract, contact Kepco. And there's email traffic and so forth about making plans for Kepco to serve this new load. Through an existing delivery point. Through an existing delivery point. Which wasn't point. capable of serving the load. The issue that came up... Uh, so that makes sense Justice that they would say contact Kepco first. Correct. It makes no sense that they, that they would ever think of contracting, contacting Sunflower because the nearest Sunflower delivery point or substation is 12 miles or more away. And they have no facilities within this circuit. Now, but, it, but the problem is, as it turns out, <clears throat> Kepco's facility isn't sufficient either. So somebody's got to put a new one in. Your Honor, somebody had to make an alteration. Under the KEPCO contract, it says that as of 1977, there are two existing delivery points and two existing substations. And the Phillipsburg substation has an initial capacity of 2,500 kilowatts not a maximum contractual uh, uh, capacity, but an initial capacity. In this situation, it's undisputed that the horsepower needs of the Jayhawk pumping station would have exceeded the kilowatt capacity of the substation. So one of two things can be done. Number one, you increase the capacity of the existing substation, bring in larger or additional transformers. Or you create a subdivision within that circuit or that area or that portion and you put an additional delivery point. It happens all the time. The 21 new delivery points that you've heard about here the, the sub, the, what the, the other parties are, are trying to convince the court is that there were 21 new areas or portions brought in and are now served by Sunflower. Not true, and that's not what the testimony was at trial. Instead, there have been 21 new delivery points in the areas already served by Sunflower since September 21, 1977. There, ha there is no new area under the sun. God only created so much of the state of Kansas. And at some point after 1977, he didn't create more, and they put more delivery points. Instead, they subdivided existing substations or areas or portions to add an additional delivery point in an area already served by Sunflower and an area that KEPCO had no contractual right to. So when the Jayhawk pumping station load, was, it was realized by everyone that the existing substation lacked sufficient capacity, 
Chepco had the right to work with Prairie Land to do one of two things, increase the capacity of the substation or add an additional delivery point within that same area or portion to serve that load. And the reason why Chepco had that right is because we had a right to serve all the power needs of that area. Not the power needs up to 2,500 kilowatts capacity, but all of the power needs. Now, I'm not well versed in electricity, but and for me, it's easier to think of the what Kepco was providing and and what these consumers were taking to think of it in a water context because I can't visualize electrons moving across transmission lines. Go, going across delivery points and getting to a, a substation then then out. But I understand water. And one thing that the trial, the, the fundamental error that the trial court made in this case is the trial court apparently thought that Kepco was selling a barrel of electricity, 2,500 kilowatts. And as long as Prairie Land took that 2,500 kilowatts and paid for it, that was all Prairie Land's responsibility was, and Prairie Land could ship that 2,500 kilowatts wherever they wanted. What the trial court didn't understand is that we weren't selling just 2,500 kilowatt, kilowatts, we were selling the ability to deliver an unlimited amount of power through a system that in that area had a capacity of 2,500 kilowatts. Now what that means is, and, I, and why I think it's easier to think about it in a water context, instead of the substation shooting out electrons, let's think of it shooting out water. That we've got a fire hose running down uh, along power lines that can deliver, let's say, uh, 50,000 gallons per hour of water far more force than you'd want to use for a consumer or other uses. So that 50,000 gallon capacity water line hits the substation and gets reduced down to smaller pipes that can only discharge out 2,500 gallons of water per hour. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that the consumers are using 2,500 gallons of water per hour. It just means that's the maximum amount that we can deliver through that pipe. And if there's lots of consumers using water, we sell a lot of water and a lot of that capacity gets used. If nobody's using water, even though there's the ability to deliver 2,500 gallons of water per hour, nothing's being taken. You've got a tap there that's available, but if users don't use it, it the capacity just sits there. Now, in this situation, what the judge said when he adopted the proposed findings of Prairie Land, he says, look at this as if you've got a trailer park in the middle of the Phillipsburg area. And let's suppose that trailer park gets blown away so that there's no users taking electricity or water in my example. The judge says that Prairie Land still has to take that 2,500 kilowatts or in my example, 2,500 gallons of water, and use it somewhere, and they have the discretion to use it wherever they want, including in other areas. That's completely wrong and misunderstands the capacity issue and misunderstands how all requirements contracts work. That is, if that trailer park in a KEPCO area gets blown away, and those consumers aren't there taking electricity anymore or taking water in my example anymore. It just means Kepco doesn't sell as much as it had before. We have no right to make up those sales somewhere else. They're lost unless and until some new consumer comes in. But Prairie Land 
can't take that 2,500 kilowatts of water or 2,500 gallons per hour of water, in my example, and shift it somewhere else. For example, it can't shift that electricity or water over into a sunflower area because then they would be violating the sunflower all requirements contract. So in my mind, that's the fundamental error that the district judge made in this case. He thought that KEPCO was selling or committing to sell a fixed amount of electricity and that as long as Prairie Land took it and paid for it, Prairie Land had the discretion to do whatever it pleased with that power. But instead, under all requirements contracts, People like KEPCO have no guarantee that we're going to sell any certain amount of power because it, it, it relates, it's based on the changing demands of the areas that we serve. And we have the obligation under the all requirements contracts to supply more power when there is more demands in these needs, in these areas. And that's why the contract refers to the substation as simply having an initial capacity. It would make no sense to take the position that the KEPCOs or the Sunflowers or the Prairie Lands of the world can't change the capacity of the delivery system as the demands increase because we have a all requirements obligation. We don't have just the obligation to supply the demands that existed on September 21, 1977, but we have the obligation to serve the demands as they change over time through the entire 20 or 30 year term of these all requirements contracts. Well, I'm, I guess I'm confused because you both have that requirement and it pertains to Prairie Land's system not to the the big overall obligation that you both have in these competing contracts is for prairie land system and then you have these exceptions like sunflower accepted out a portion of prairie land system or in your contract an area and so i don't know that i i, I don't understand how you can have two competing outputs contracts to provide all needs. And that's, that's the problem I, I can't get past here. When you think of the area or portion being a circuit and the entire prairie land system being divided into circuits, the circuit that we have at Phillipsburg, KEPCO has the right to serve all the demand inside that circuit or that area during the entire term of the contract. But KEPCO contracted to serve Prairie Land's entire system. But it accepted, it, it, the, the KEPCO contract was drafted with 19 members in mind, only two of which had existing contracts with Sunflower. And so everybody's contract, including Sunflower, including Prairie Land, has the reference that if you are already a member of Sunflower, then here's how it works, and that is consistent with the Sunflower contractual language. And in fact, Earl Watkins, the president and CEO of Sunflower, testified at trial that that was consistent with his understanding and his view of life was that KEPCO had the absolute right to serve the Phillipsburg area or portion to the exclusion of Sunflower. And the only thing that Mr. Watkins disagreed with KEPCO on is his view is that if there needed to be a new delivery point within the area, that he thought Sunflower got that. But Sunflower has agreed from day one with this concept that prairie land is divided permanently into sunflower areas and prairie and KEPCO areas. Is KEPCO required to provide the power regardless of the demand? 
Well, the, both the Sunflower con All Requirements Contract and the KEPCO contract say to the extent that they have power available to them. But during the life of the KEPCO contract, Prairie Land has never claimed that KEPCO failed to have sufficient power or breached the contract in any way, shape, or form. We have any further questions of counsel? Just, just one. I just want to try and draw an analogy, a very simple one. Your position is that Prairie Land's system is a jigsaw puzzle and that you have certain pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and Sunflower has certain other pieces, but they interlock and within any one puzzle piece, you're exclusive. Absolutely. And the record is replete with these circuit diagrams that have not changed from 1976 to the present. All of these circuit diagrams show the Phillipsburg substation, Phillipsburg area, whether it's the 1976 one or any time up to the present. So the, those lines that are in those circuit diagrams, in the words of the other side, not my words, operational boundaries, and that if you want to look to see who was serving any certain location at any point in time, you go to the circuit diagram and it has all the answers. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. The uh, comments regarding the circuit diagram uh, remind me that I must underscore to you that if KEPCO wanted area or areas of the system to be defined in a geographical or spatial sense, they would have done like every lawyer's every lawyer does in a land contract. They would have had a legal description or some way to define that. Instead, the circuit diagram argument that Mr. Sear makes did not arise well until did, after this litigation. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did I misunderstand? I understood that that, that KEPCO contract was a contract drawn to encompass 23 different companies or members and their respective uh, uh, areas. I, am I wrong? Was this one contract to, to deal with not just Prairie Land's uh, operational boundaries, but other companies also? Your Honor, if if, if that's the case, uh, then they could have attached specific legal descriptions to the specific member signing that contract. However, paragraph 6B only applied to the two well, members, one of which was Prairie Land. Regardless of how they could have made it better, yeah. tell me why that these contracts don't deal with operational boundaries that are determined by the circuit diagram. The circuit diagram never came up until after this litigation no, was I, I don't care about coming up. Just tell me why that isn't uh, uh, the uh, intent of the contract and the way to construe the contract is that there are operational boundaries. That's how people operate, and those operational boundaries are uh, defined or determined by the circuit diagram. That's just how everyone operates. Tell me why that isn't the case. Because it, it didn't say so, Your Honor. It, it could have been more specific, and it left a huge unknown there as to what areas meant. Didn't say operational boundaries, didn't mention circuit diagrams, and and it also, while it addressed Prairie Land's rights under the prior Sunflower Agreement, it then attempted to erode those obligations well, in let, paragraph let's, 6B. Let's, let's take another tack. Regardless of the specific language of these contracts, have all concerned operated under that basis at least since 19, uh, September 21st, 1977, that there were operational boundaries 
established by circuit diagrams. Has that been how everyone has operated? No, Your Honor. I, I think in this instance, the testimony of Mr. Miller was that that Prairie Land would try to configure its system in a manner that would best serve its members. It changed delivery points, uh, who served them. In addition, the uh, they would make determinations as to what was best for the customer. In this particular instance, we have this further issue with the agreement where it talks about whether a particular supplier has the energy and facilities available to serve a particular load or delivery point. The contract does not say who makes that call. The contract as drafted by CAPCO does not say who gets to make the call as to whether there's sufficient energy or facilities available. Uh, Mr. Miller's testimony was is he looked at his options and tried to determine how best to, ter to serve this new load, which was a dramatically large load. He made a, a, a call and tried to serve the guy at the end of the line as best he could. So I, I, I think that uh, that may be going far afield from your question, but I, I believe that the KEPCO agreement is ambiguous, and I'm res respectfully requesting that you reinstate the finding of the district court. Thank you. Any further questions of counsel? Just a fact question. Uh, one of the first things that was said by your opponent when he stood up was that these, I can't remember now whether the number was 21 or 22 new um, delivery points that were developed right. during the life of the Sunflower contract, that all of them were developed within this circuit diagrams configuration that existed before, that, 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 that the circuit diagram lines or those puzzle piece lines that I was using as my analogy a few minutes ago were not breached. Do you agree with that or do you think that's factually inaccurate? This, this, the, the new delivery points stretch over probably 80 to 100 miles in, in a broad variety of areas. Mm -hmm. You know, broad, broad variety of new loads. Okay. So, but but are they all within what he describes as these operational boundaries formed by the circuit diagrams? Are they all they're, within? They're them? all shown on circuit diagrams, which circuit diagrams that preexisted. Yeah, yeah. Circuit diagrams can increase or change over time and cover different ports of, parts of Prairieland system. So you disagree with his representation that that circuit diagram hasn't changed at all. I believe I would, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what I need to know. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. We thank all counsel for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.